you know, one of the things we're kind of famous for in sediment transport is we have lots of equations and they give very different answers. Um, and so we obviously choose the ones that are appropriate and we test different ones. And if you were to go back and look at my body of work, I think you would find that the sediment transport equation I use the most often is the Larson Copeland method. And it's not an accident that your name is on that. What was your contribution to the Larson Copeland transport function? Well, basically, uh, that that equation was developed when we worked on the Corte Madera Creek uh, project in uh, San Francisco Bay area. It came out of a hill area and into the bay, and uh, it was a con there was a concrete channel that they had built, and then not finished because of environmental reasons, mm. and so there was no debris basin or anything like that at the upstream end, and so it had a uh, source of uh, gravel coming in and uh, it also had a uh, layer of uh, silt that deposited in the in the concrete channel because of uh, backwater from the from the bay so it had a, an interesting bed composition it had a lot of gravel and it was usually layered and it had um, silt it had and the sand whole, this, it had the whole that's, range that's and, a wide range and they were um, and it was a concrete channel, so you'd expect it would flush out during floods, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't. We wanted to, I wanted to use the Larson equation because it uh, was a size class equation. It was developed for size classes. At the time, there weren't very many that did that. Which, which, which means that you know, a lot of the transport functions just used the median grain right. size. But Larson was actually designed to be applied to different grain classes. That's correct. All right. And uh, at the time, there weren't very many Toffoletti... Einstein. But Larson's equation wasn't developed for gravel. Yeah, right. There was no gravel in his test. But he did have an interesting uh, factor in that he could also, he, he also had data for, for very coarse silt. So Which he is, had, I think it's the only transport function that goes into that range at all. Well, except for Larson Copa. <laughs> right, right, yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, so basically what I did was to look at his equation and see how we could modify it for gravels because we weren't getting, the equations that we had, we weren't getting transport of gravels sufficient. Okay. Sufficiently. And you guys, how do I know that? Well. How do you know that? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't washing out. So I said, that this is not modeling the gravel. And it was. You know, we, none of the equations were moving that gravel. I right. said, well, that, it has to be coming out of there. Right. You, you saw it in the prototype, uh, yeah. and it wasn't happening in the model. Right. So I looked at his equation, and one of the things was that he used uh, average bed steer stress. Okay. Well, I said, you know, you should be using grain bed shear stress. Can you tell me, what's, what's the difference between that? <clears throat> well, there are two, two factors uh, that, that eat up the, the bed shear stress. One is uh, the friction. Okay. And one is the actual movement of of uh, the the, uh, uh, the sediment. So there's two two forces to be overcome by the stress. Could, is it would it would it be like a helpful way of thinking about it that like there are some aspects of the river that kind of waste shear stress or that yes. that that where shear stress is lost to like bed forms and things that aren't directly moving the particles. So you have to right. you have to zero in on the part of the shear stress that's actually moving particles, right? And that's the grain shear. That's very good. That's exactly it. Okay. And so we used the, the Limerino's equation to uh, to determine that. Okay. In in, in the uh, Larson Copeland function. If you if you go to the manual and you look at the Larson Copeland function, the algorithm that develops the shear the grain shear is longer than the transport function itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there, then there was another issue with uh, critical shear stress. Uh, you know, when Shields did his work in Germany, he uh, he didn't actually measure the critical shear stress. He well, did it. No, he measured uh, he measured sediment transport, and he took he got a relationship between sediment transport uh, and the uh, uh, the shear stress, and so. He kind of he, he took a bunch of data and got a curve and linearly extrapolated back to the zero point. To zero point, and that was the critical shear stress. Okay. So he never actually measured. And if you ever look at a, f a flume out here, which I know you have in the yesterday. temperature flume, we, we were running it yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you can't figure out when critical no, shear stress is. No, no, right. That way. So that's how, how he did it. He extrapolated back, and that's that's a, that's a good way to um, determine 
cheer stress. Yeah. If you've got a sand bed stream and you're tra- calculating sediment of transport and then you want to take the shear stress and the critical shear stress and find out what, what's the level of shear stress right. that is um, <coughs> actually employed in moving the sediment. And can we just define the critical shear stress is the, the shear stress at which a grain class moves. So a, right. a, a, so a critical shear, if the shear stress is below that, the that grain class isn't moving, in, like in theory. And if it, the shear stress is above it, then that grain class is moving. Right. That's, right. that's, that's the idea. <clears throat> That's fine for sand. Now, but when you get into gravel, you know, you can have two gravel sizes in the same size class and the same shear stress, and one of them moves and the other one doesn't. That's right. And so what um, Paintall did, he actually, instead of using the Shields curve, he, uh, uh, well, he extended it, you know, instead of extrapolating straight back, he actually did more measurements in, in, in the curve instead of, instead of, Extrapolating back straight, it actually comes down uh, uh, considerably. Oh, uh, and so the critical shear stress is a lot less than yeah. 0.04 or 0.06, um, and it's less. And in fact, I think uh, the guy named Andrews came up with the, the lowest he came up with was 0.02 yeah. was the shear stress, I think. And uh, and then Paynell actually actually came up with a uh, curve. To define that, so <clears throat> I used that curve to decrease the critical shear stress for gravel. So, like in Marapir Mueller, it's in the high 0.04s, right. and in um, in Larson Copeland, it's 0.039. Well, in Larson, I think it's 0.039, but in also in Larson Copeland, it'll go down to 0.02. Oh, because it's a function. Of it's a function of the shear stress and the grain size. Okay. Which means that you will get more gravel transport. Right. Um, at which you weren't getting enough. Yeah. And then I gathered a lot of data. Actually, it was from probably from Brownlee, where he had uh, compiled data from lots of flume studies with gravel in them. And uh, that was a, that was a really good data. That is a really good database mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, so I had to in, in Larson Larson's equation. There's a function of um, that is used to determine the sediment transport. But anyway, I had to take all the data and um, back calculate what that function would, would be. Okay. So, so I re- redid that functional uh, equation. And I think, I think um, I'm pretty sure I gave you that information for the, one of the streams I used was the Rio Porco. That's right. And it had some very fine material in it. So and I extended that, that curve beyond what uh, Larson had and it, it uh, so it's extended in two directions. It has a uh, new definition for fine sand, very fine silt. It could be fine sand, but it, that and then also for gravel. One thing about the, the, the Larson Copeland function is that I would, I think it's a good thing to use in a computer program mm-hmm. that is coupled with uh, armoring algorithm. Yes. Or sorting algorithm, but right. it is not appropriate to use as a standalone equation. Okay. Because it, the, the, the armoring algorithm will um, appropriately define the bed grade, the surface, the cover layer, the right. surface gradation. Um, <clears throat> whereas if you just take a bed gradation that uh, you gathered in the field, it likely will have too much of the fine material in it. That's right. The uh, uh, Lodge and Colton does not have a hiding function. Right. It is relying on the armoring algorithm right. to provide that armoring or divide that hiding factor. So if you were to just code up Larson Copeland in a spreadsheet, you're probably going to over predict um, a transport because you need a sorting and armoring algorithm right. to determine, you know, the, the the preferential availability of gravels. Exactly, and so I think it's it works it works fine in the computer program. Yeah, but uh, it's not going to work. I w- you know I wouldn't I wouldn't put it in the ASC instead of manual. You can't. I think it goes back to the, you, the if you really want to do a just stand alone, you're better off using the D50. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, okay. So, so that's I think, but that's a key factor that uh, you can get uh, a really s- much too high of a transport with a large and Copeland. And I was surprised to find that when I uh, when I first started using it. Right. Okay. Well, that leads very nicely into the last thing I want to talk to you about um, is that. Uh, your dissertation work at Iowa, 
um, you developed a hiding, a mixing, hiding, and armoring um, algorithm. Which will get its own video. We'll spin out a te another technical video like this on the Copeland bed mixing and armoring algorithm, also known as XNER7. Uh, if you like this content and if you're interested in more of what Dr. Copeland has to say, we also recorded a podcast with him on you know, kind of less technical but just as interesting content. We, you know, we asked him questions about the core's background in river restoration, some of the stuff that he's done on river restoration channel design, and some of the stuff on Mississippi River sediment processes and modeling. That podcast will be released as part of the RSM River Mechanics podcast that'll start coming out summer 2022. So look for that. This initiative was funded by the Regional Sediment Management R&D Program, also the Flood and Coastal R&D Program, and the recording and editing that went into this technical video for the RAS manual was supported by the H Agency Science and Technology Program. My name is Stanford Gibson, and I'm the Sediment Transport Specialist on the RAS team.